C4C divers. Thank you for tuning in. We are doing a Facebook Live. I know we kind of took some time over the summer to give you guys your space and you guys could go off and do some diving or some travel or you have the kids and they were in your hair, but we're back. Facebook Live. Here we are. And September is Shark Month at 4C. So a long time ago when I started working at the dive shop, I said, you know what? They have this thing called Shark Week. So why not do a shark month where we talk about sharks and we talk about the importance of them, uh, that we like to go diving with them and the research and conservation behind sharks here locally and also globally. And so um, if you've been a fan of 4C for a while, uh, hopefully you've attended some of these great presentations. And so we have one scheduled for tonight, guys. I'm really excited. A new researcher I've never worked with before. Uh, we've got Aaron Spencer. Everyone say hello to Aaron. All right. And the way you guys can say hello is in the comments section. Go ahead and write hello and let her know where you're listening in from. Are you here in Florida? Are you outside of Florida? Uh, where are you listening in from? We want to know. So um, the other thing, too, in that comment section, if you have questions, you can write them there and she'll either answer them during the presentation or at the end. So, guys, it is... Um, Always good to stay until the end. And why is that? Because we're going to be doing a raffle. If you have not gone over to our 4 c website to register for tonight, you want to go to www.force-e.com before 645, so you still have a few minutes. Go over there and register your name and your email, and we're going to put you in a random name picker. We're going to raffle off some stuff at the end of this. So if you don't do it, I can't give you any prizes. So hopefully we get some winners tonight, and you guys can go woohoo in the chat to let us know that you're excited that you won. And um, again, it like I said, it is uh, Shark Month at 4C. And you, we have these great presentations planned. We also have some great dives planned. So if you want to go out and see some sharks, um, we have a shark dive out of Jupiter planned uh, October 7th. It's a Saturday. If you want more information, again, go to our website. Uh, we also have, if you guys are interested in shark tooth collecting, the fossilized shark tooth. So, you know, those big megalodon tooths that you see people collecting. Guys, right now, because of all of the storms that hit the other side of Florida, um, people are finding these big teeth. And so if you want to get on one of those uh, trips, we have one October 14th and 15th. You don't have to go on both days, but if you want to do both days, you can. Uh, it's a three tank dive over um, on Venice Beach or in Venice Beach, and it's an opportunity for you to go search for fossilized uh, shark teeth. So if you want information on that trip, uh, again, go to our website. And one more thing, okay, it's not till December. However, there is a, a season for hammerheads in Bimini, Bahamas. And we had these uh, trips last uh, season, and they were so popular, guys. They are so cool. If you want to see a hammerhead shark up close, in that nice, beautiful blue crystal water. And also it's super shallow, so you can have lots of time with them. Come with us to Bimini. We have a trip planned December 17th and it's already like halfway full because I don't know why. It's just, everybody wants to go see them. So it's a day trip. You just go over on the ferry and you do the dives and then you come back on the ferry that night. So we have one planned right now for December 17th. And then we'll have some other ones in January and February as well. We're just waiting for the ferry to give us their schedule. Um, but if you can make it to that one, go over to our website, go ahead and register. We'll get you more information. But guys, so much fun. So many fun shark events during shark month. So I, I, I see all these people are saying hello to you. Do you see that, Aaron? Everyone's saying yeah, hi. Yeah, I'm so Aaron? excited. Yeah. All right. So there we go. My microphone. Hopefully you guys can hear me because it keeps telling me I'm disconnected. I don't know how to use these iPod things. I'm going to take it out. <laughs> we can hear you. Don't worry. I'm going to let Aaron introduce herself, um, who she is research world um and we're gonna uh take it away thank you so much and i'm sorry i had i'm sorry I had, i'm having some problems with the sound can everyone hear me okay 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 um 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for letting me join you today to talk about my research. Um, and I wanted to say, first and foremost, thank you for sharing where, where you all are coming from. It's cool to see lots of other Florida folks represented here. And then I also want to give a shout out to the listener from Virginia, Bart. I am from Baltimore, Maryland originally, but I did my undergrad in Virginia. And it's always this time of year that I get nostalgic for the Mid-Atlantic. And I love living in South Florida, but there's something about you know September, October that makes me miss Virginia just a little bit. So, um, but today I'm gonna talk to you about the research we are doing here in South Florida. Um, again, my name is Erin Spencer. I am a PhD candidate. I'm in my fifth year of my PhD at Florida International University down here in Miami. Um, and I want to show you a little bit about my background first, and then I'm going to jump in to the sort of research that we're doing down here. All right, ready to rock. Um, so as I said, I'm Erin. I am a diver. Um, I will say I got my certification in a quarry in Pennsylvania where you couldn't even see your fins. Um, so I'm very, very grateful to now be living in such a beautiful place where I get to dive not only as a recreational diver here, but also as part of my research. Um, this is a photo that was in the Galapagos Islands. Um, I did my master's at UNC Chapel Hill and we did research down in the Galapagos there. And I would say this was very interesting field work. We were looking at densities of different urchins and how they were grazing and also their tolerance to changing temperatures. Um, and the weirdest part about this particular field research was that we were setting these long transects to look at densities of urchins and the sea lions kept coming and taking our transects in their mouths and playing with them and swimming away with them. And I was like, no one ever taught me how I'm supposed to handle rogue sea lions messing up our field research. Um, so all in a day's work, I guess, of being a field biologist where you're actually out there um, interacting with all these animals. Next, please. Um, so as I said, now I uh, work here mostly in uh, Miami and the West Palm region. I also do a lot of work over in Sarasota, Florida, um, but my research has taken me all over the place um, from close to the Bahamas or all the way over to Fiji. I looked at invasive species in Fiji and traveling um, throughout other places as well. Uh, as I mentioned, I am a field biologist, meaning I actually have to go out into the field to collect my data. Um, and that's something that everyone on this call is familiar with because we're going out and diving in the environment all the time. Um, I do a lot of outreach to students, especially younger students. Um, and I always remind them that being in the field is not the only way that you can be a research scientist. Um, I think I, I meet, especially meet some folks, especially young girls in middle school and high school, and they're like, I really want, I really like science, but I get seasick and I'm not sure this is what I want to do. And so I always remind them there's lots of ways to be a scientist as part of your job and then also a citizen scientist. Um, but I happen to choose the one where I get to go out in the field. Next, please. Um, and as you know, uh, some days look like this. So this was in Curacao. We were staying right at the end of the dock. Here was a study we were working on invasive lionfish, which again, I'm sure many people, especially our Florida folks, are familiar with on this call. Um, we woke up in the morning, got to just put our dive gear on, walk a couple feet, and then jump into this beautiful crystal clear, clear water. The diving down there is spectacular. If you've been in Bonaire and Curacao, it was spectacular. Um, but not every day looks like that, and it's a job, and I have to show up whether I want to or not. And so the next slide, I have an example of what a day looks like when conditions are not so good. And it's actually a video, so let's see if we can play it. Um, but if not, oh, there you go. So this was in Fiji. Um, this was a small boat. We were traveling between two islands, and it was about a three-hour boat ride. And the conditions were so bad that we had to wedge ourselves in between the supplies and the side of the boat. And you can see from my face that I'm having a terrible time. I am not having a good time. I'm questioning all my life decisions. And halfway through this boat ride, the captain stopped the boat to pray. And that was a story that it took many years to be able to tell my mother um, because it was definitely a stressful experience. Um, but, you know, and next slide, please. 
Um, but then sometimes my research is actually not always in the field. Uh, my background before I started doing shark research was actually working with fisheries and more specifically sustainable seafood. Um, and I wanted to include this just a little bit because it's something that is near and dear to so many of us, especially if you live by the coast, um, looking at uh, seafood and seafood mislabeling. So I specifically looked at red snapper mislabeling and studied, I used DNA uh, technologies, which I used to have to explain, but now many people are familiar with PCR. Um, I did DNA extractions and PCR to look at the identity of seafood fillets. And essentially, are we eating what we think we're eating? Um, and unfortunately, for in this particular case in Red Snapper, the study that I did was looking at samples from North Carolina to Florida, and 72.6% of my samples were mislabeled, about 75%. So three quarters of them said they were Red Snapper, and it turns out it was actually something else. And the, the ones that were most likely to be mislabeled were from sushi restaurants. Many of them are selling you tilapia and telling you it's something else. Um, but I will say a bit of positive news. The best uh, retailers of my whole study were in Florida, and it was mostly these uh, local seafood vendors that can pinpoint exactly where their fish is coming from. Also, Whole Foods does a really good job. Next, please. Um, I want to give another little snapshot of a day in the field. I was staying at a bunch of Airbnbs during my study, um, try, really trying to save money. So I was staying in like rooms in people's houses. And this photo was taken by a woman um, who walked in that I was staying in her house. And she was like, well, this is a new one. I had a bunch of dead fish in her shower um, and then was taking all these samples and then cooked them up that night. So I definitely shared some with her checked later with the when I finally ran my analysis. And this was not actually red snapper that we ate. It was a lane snapper that was being sold as red snapper. Next, please. Oh, yeah, there's our. <laughs> um, so I will move on from this. But if you ever want to talk sustainable seafood, that is my other passion. Um, also, I worked with the recreational red snapper fishery. So there's lots to dig, in, dig into there. But that is not why we are here today. It is shark month, not red snapper month. So I want to talk to you about the work, the shark work that we are doing down here in South Florida. Uh, next, please. Um, so of course, um, I have to start off with an amazing picture of a great hammerhead. And this is a plug because this photo I took in the Bimini shark dive that some folks have the opportunity to go with Force E in a couple months to do as well. Um, so this was, uh, this is a very spectacular dive that you get to be up close with these animals. Um, they are my study animal. I've been spending them or studying them for the last couple of years. And still, every time I get to see one up close, it takes my breath away. They're really such spectacular animals. And I know anyone that's had the opportunity to see a shark, especially while diving, um, knows that same feeling. So uh, I, as I said, I study great hammerheads. Um, they are critically endangered species. Um, they are one of the, they are the largest of all the hammerhead species and also one of the most well-known hammerhead species. Um, actually one of the most well-known sharks of, of all. Um, and if you look at, for example, the content that you're seeing on Shark Fest or Shark Week, you know, a lot of these big sharks get a lot of the attention, whether that's the bull sharks, tiger sharks, great hammerhead sharks, et cetera. Um, but despite all of that knowledge, uh, public knowledge about great hammerheads, and we know that they're endangered and we know that they're in trouble, um, there's actually not a lot that we know about their underlying uh, physical mechanisms. We're still learning so much about their behavior and their movement. And that's partially because these animals are really difficult to study. They're really big. They travel really, really long distances. Um, and you can't easily keep them in captivity. They're also very sensitive. Um, they are actually more sensitive than some other sharks when it comes to being on the line. Um, so there are ways that we are trying to learn more about these animals to help better influence conservation measures to protect them. Um, so there are many, many ways that you can study sharks. Um, that is a fun conversation for another time, going through all these research methods that you could do to study these great animals. Um, but the sort of research that I do, it requires us to actually handle the sharks. Uh, that means that we are using a scientifically permitted fishing method. We go through not just the university, um, but FWC and some other like, federal agencies as well in order to get all of the permits that we need and the training that we need to study these animals in a way um, that will minimize stress on the animal and also be safe for us as researchers. So in this photo, you can see this is a 
team of scientists all from FIU and we have a great hammerhead. This was right off of uh, West Palm Beach. Um, what uh, we, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and then what I do is I put it, what is called a biologger on the dorsal fin of that great hammerhead shark to study its movements and behaviors. So you can see what I'm holding in my hand. Um, it looks kind of funny. You should see it when I take it through an airport. TSA has so many questions for me about this particular contraption. Um, but so a biologger is essentially like a Fitbit for a shark. The technology that I'm using, uh, it has a bunch of different sensors, including a speed sensor, looks at acceleration, depth, temperature, and magnetism, which I'll talk to you about how we use that in just a second. Um, I also have other sensors like a video camera um, or even a sonar tag that we were able to actually, when a video, you know, sometimes the visibility is not very good or during the nighttime when it's too dark, the sonar helps us see potential um, fish encounters or prey encounters. It's pretty much just like a, a small fish finder that I'm putting on the back of the hammerhead shark. Um, it's attached to the dorsal fin with a clamp. Um, so it actually just clamps right on the dorsal fin. It happens super fast. Um, the way we do the shark workups, I would describe as like a NASCAR pit stop. We bring the shark in alongside the boat. We secure it by the head and the tail. And then we take measurements to see how large the animal is. And then I clamp that tag on. We remove the hook and we let it go. And the whole thing takes just a couple minutes. I mean, you know, our fastest workups are under two minutes. So we really are trying to minimize the time that that animal is next to the vessel, let it go quickly, minimize stress, um, and that make sure it swims on its way happy and healthy. Um, now you can see that that's, that spent sensor is not the only thing I have in there. On the other photo on the side, um, you can see these two antenna that are sticking out of the top of the tag. Um, so the way this tag looks here is what it looks like after it's been released from the shark. So the tag is designed to only stay on for about 24 to 48 hours. It's connected with this metal that starts to dissolve as soon as it hits seawater. So after 24 to 48 hours, the whole thing pops off and this tag floats to the surface. And then those antenna send signals to me so I know where to pick it up. Uh, one is called a satellite tag and it sends a satellite signal and I get coordinates to my phone, but that's not super exact. There's still a little bit of error there. Um, so then I use a VHF tag or a radio tag to listen for it. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Um, well, here's a, I, I went out of order. Here's an example of what the tag looks like when it's actually on the dorsal fin. Um, you can see I am putting the tag on, securing it really quickly. We have my colleague, Sarah, on the tail, and then my other colleague, Candace, on the head of the shark. And you can see that she's actually securing or uh, bracing this, the head of the hammerhead because they're known for their big, beautiful cephalofoils, their hammerhead, but they have eyes on either side of the hammer. So she's trying to make sure that that shark doesn't look to the side and hit its eye on the side of the boat. Um, so we are all working quite quickly to let it go. And then next slide, please. Um, but going back, you can see uh, on the left side, I am looking for the tag with that VHF re receiver. So I'm listening for a little click, click, click of the tag. It makes a very small noise. And you might think this tag looks really vibrant. Um, you know, it's, it's bright orange, but only about two inches of that tag it sits above the ocean water. Um, and that means that it can be incredibly difficult to find. Actually, anyone that's looked for a safety sausage that is not fully inflated above the surface of the water, that thing might look like it would be really easy to spot, but they're deceptively difficult, especially when you get a little chop in the water as well. Um, so sometimes it can take hours for us to find this tag. And on the left-hand side, my face, you can see I'm pretty serious pretty frustrated because it was just enough chop and that it would, we were circling around. I knew the tag was close and we just couldn't find it. But then you can see on the right-hand side, my, it's the happiest moments of my life when I find these tags after waiting, waiting, waiting. Um, there's so many things that need to go right in order to get this data. Not only do we have to catch a hammerhead shark, um, now, and then we have to, it has to be in good condition. You know, we never work up an animal that we think is too stressed. We will let them go immediately. And then this tag has to go out in the water and then it has to pop off. I have to get a signal. And then we have to make sure that that great hammerhead hasn't swum into the middle of the Gulf Stream, in which case that tag pops off and I might be able to see it, but I, you know, that tag could be to St. Augustine before I have the time to get it, right? Um, but then I actually have to get the tag back. So there's so many things that have to go right. And I, I'm happy to say, 
of all my deployments, years of doing this, I've only lost one tag. And that was because of a, a faulty uh, satellite tag that we were using. And I know it's somewhere, it's somewhere, maybe it's in Juneau Beach, maybe it's in Daytona, but somewhere along the coast of Florida. So hopefully someone finds it and calls me about it one day. Um, someone asked, uh, has a boater found the tags before you and turned it in? That's never happened to me. Some other folks that have, that use this biolocking technology that has happened before. Uh, one of my colleagues, they were tracking on the satellite tag that, you know, the shark, the sharks, you know, they don't, they only move so far in a day. Right. And then all of a sudden this tag was like in North Carolina and because someone got it and drove up 95 <laughs> before calling it about it. So um, that does happen, but you'd be surprised how difficult these are to actually spot. You'd be much more likely uh, on the Gulf side, for example, where you don't have such, you know, the, the strong currents of the Gulf Stream that maybe the way the currents work would bring it closer into shore. You're more likely to have someone call from the beach, um, but that's never happened to me. Um, next, please. Um, so I've done this now for about five years and the number of full complete accurate data sets that we have is only 10, um, which sounds like not very much, but I'm happy to say it's 10 more that have been published in the literature so far, specifically for the sort of data that we're looking for, which is this speed sensor data. Um, but I wanna show you a little bit of what we can do with it. So if you go to the next slide, here's an example of some of the uh, things I can learn from the tags. Um, the next slide has a, 3D model of uh, some of the tracks. So I'm interested in um, the sort of movement patterns of the shark within this short period of time. Some of you might have seen tracks like this before. If you've seen, they're, that looks similar. If you've seen, for example, O-Search or the Bimini Shark Lab, where they put these satellite tags on sharks and they look at their movements over days, months, weeks, or I'm sorry, like weeks, months, years, right? That's not what this is. This is a super fine scale where we're only looking at hours to days worth of data. Um, so although those tracks can help us see like geographically where the sharks are, uh, my tracks are really looking at patterns in their movement. You know, are they staying in a certain area for a certain amount of time? Um, you know, does that indicate maybe they're trying to forage or hunt? Um, what we see a lot with these tracks, so this is actually what you're looking at now, is a top-down view of one of the shark tracks that I... Um, deployed off of West Palm Beach. So if you see, if you picture this as like, you know, an X, Y axis, right? Kind of the, the way the shark is moving um, from a top down view. What you don't see from this particular figure is the depth. Um, and one of the cool things that we've learned that we've seen in these tags is that these sharks really are go really varying in their depths. They're going up to the surface, they're going back down to a hundred plus feet. They're coming back up to the surface. They really do this up and down pattern as a way to either forage for food or even save energy. Um, and then from there, we can look at all sorts of cool patterns in the way that they move. If you go to the next slide, um, the other thing that I do with these tags is actually start to look at the metabolics of these sharks. Uh, how are they using energy? How much food do they need to eat to sustain their movement? Um, and the way I do that is I build uh, an energy budget where you know if you think about here this figure, this is all the ways that the shark uses energy. You have your standard metabolic rate, um, that sort of basic amount of energy that's required to keep the lights on. Uh, you have food assimilation. So, you know, after you eat, your digestion requires energy. How much does that require? Um, some energy or some food is lost as waste as well so that they can actually take that up. Um, growth and reproduction. So for example, younger sharks, juvenile sharks are spending much more energy putting on muscle, body mass, et cetera, than an older shark that's already reached maturity would have to do. Um, or for example, uh, a female hammerhead, when it's um, like every other year and they reproduce, she's going to put a lot more energy into building those pups than she would have to do in another year. Uh, yeah, this particular uh, shark is not a hammerhead. This is just a model to look at the energetic cost. But you know what? That's a good point. Randy, I should replace this figure with something that actually has a hammerhead on it. Um, but the key thing we can get from the tags that I'm putting out is you see this little orange section. This is activity level. So most of the energy that is taken in is actually going to be spent on activity. It's really costly to swim about. Um, and as we know that many sharks, they have to keep swimming in order to uh, breathe. So a lot of their energy is going to go towards activity. 
So part of my research is taking all of this data that we're getting from the biologgers and combining it with previous research that, for example, tells us how much uh, the food assimilation costs or um, how much energy they have to put towards growth. And I put that all together and then I'm able to calculate um, how much they would need to eat. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, there's a question, uh, catching the hammerheads, are we fishing or catching them in a different way? Um, we use a scientifically permitted method of fishing. Um, it's actually, the way it works is that the sharks can continue to free swim after they've been caught. So they're not fighting against the line. So that reduces stress. Um, and then we also use uh, circle hooks instead of J hooks. There's a lot of uh, components to that type of fishing, uh, which reduce stress on the animal. But for this particular research, we do have to secure the animal on the side of the boat. Um, and then, right. Okay. So back to, uh, part of what I can do is that when, when I have this energy budget built and say, okay, how many calories does a hammerhead need to eat in order to swim at this pace at this temperature throughout the day, then I can translate that into, you know, how much would they need to eat to sustain it? Um, how much would they need to eat in a day? How much would they need to eat in a month, et cetera? Um, and as we know, if you're down here, uh, we have the black tip migration that happens in February-ish area in the spring uh, here in South Florida, and great hammerheads do eat black tips. So I can actually then look and say, you know, if a shark, if a great hammerhead shark eats a black tip, how much would that sustain it for? And um, unfortunately, some of this. I do have some results, but they are all under embargo because they are going to be published. Um, so check back with me, hopefully in a couple months, and I'll be able to give you all of the answers to these questions. <laughs> um, but next slide, please. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is how exciting it is not only to be able to do this research, but be able to share this research. Um, I feel incredibly lucky to work on these species and know that they have a place in many, many people's hearts. Um, so one of the things that I really enjoy doing is outreach to students, especially young kids. Um, I get the wildest questions from elementary schoolers. First of all, uh, harder than any test I've had to take in my life. They really come in hot with the tough questions. Um, and then sometimes they know so much about green hammerheads. Sometimes they're asking me about dinosaurs, which I have to say is not my area of expertise. However, I encourage you to go look that up and we can learn about it together. Um, and then we've been fortunate to be able to share this as well on National Geographic Shark Fest in World's Biggest Hammerhead, cover some of the biologging research, as well as that was from two years ago and last year, um, there was um, bulls versus hammerheads. So looking at these different qualities of two of these top predators and how they compare. Of course, we I worked on the great hammerhead side. Um, and then we actually have uh, others coming out next year. So really excited to share more about this research. Um, we also, FIU, um, I'm part of a much broader research team at FIU. There are many scientists within my lab, which is the Predator Ecology and Conservation Lab, working on different uh, questions about sharks, not just here, but around the world. A um, couple of things, it's always fun to go into the lab because people are working on so many different things, including using genetics to look at the components of the shark fin trade and trying to identify um, endangered species that are being illegally transported. Um, or even, you know, there's other folks using brubs or baited remote underwater video systems. Think of like a GoPro that you drop in the ocean and see what's around. Um, they're using brubs to look at oceanic white tip sharks and, and other species that we find here in South Florida as well. Um, so there's a lot of different research that goes on. And we also have a lot of different partnerships. So we, the coolest thing about this research is that you cannot do it by yourself. You always have to work with a broader team. And then we have great partnerships as well. We work with Moat Marine Lab in Sarasota, Florida, as well as down in the Keys. Um, and locally, we work with the Anjari Foundation, uh, which is a research vessel that takes students out. Um, and they have a program called Coastal Ocean Explorers that's all centered around sharks where students can come out and actually do this research with us. Um, and the sharks that we tag there directly contributes to the scientific research questions we're trying to answer in the lab. Um, and it's a way that we can do a lot of outreach to students within West Palm, uh, West Palm County, as well as even um, the Broward and Miami-Dade. 
Um, as I said, I'm not originally from Florida. I'm a very grateful uh, Floridian now. Um, one of the most interesting things to see when working with students here is just how many of them are so well informed about the ocean environment and are so passionate about the ocean. Um, and you know, you've got folks in there that have been uh, on the water since they were born. And I think it's it's so fun to work with them um, because they bring such knowledge and excitement to those conversations. And I'm really, really hopeful about uh, the future of our ocean stewardship with these with these kids that uh, that grew up on the water and are excited to continue protecting its species. Um, I have, I want to make sure we leave some time for questions, but I do, if you'll indulge me, have one other thing that I want to share with you um, that's in the same vein of outreach, um, which is that in addition to being a researcher by day, I also love to continue the outreach by, on my nights and weekends. And if you go to the next slide, um, I wrote a book um, called The World of Coral Reefs that's specifically targeting students, partially inspired by the work that I was doing with folks around here. This photo was taken at Blue Heron Bridge, which I know probably almost everyone on this call has, if you if you live down here, you've been at Blue Heron. Um, and we actually got to take some photos. I should have included it, but there's some photos of me diving with the book um, near Blue Heron and then the whole thing disintegrated because obviously you're not supposed to take the book in salt water, but we got some good photos in the meantime. Um, I wrote this book as a, uh, it's a kid's book for uh, like about seven to 10 years old uh, kids. Um, and it's all scientifically um, peer reviewed research that is translated to a young audience. And if you go to the next slide, um, it was a way that I could um, share some of the things that I love about the ocean and things that I've seen as a researcher, but also as a recreational scuba diver, you know, those things that when we go under the water, and you know, you see a turtle for the first time or the hundredth time, and it's always so exciting. You know, we're so fortunate that as divers, we get to see that for ourselves. But I know you are all very likely aware, like think about this as well. Not everyone has the opportunity to do that. And so it's really special um, to be able to share some of those experiences and stories with young kids. And for example, I work on um, sharks, but my favorite animals are octopuses. Um, so, and, and I have such a soft spot in my heart for invertebrates. If you go to the next slide, um, even though I talk to, I talk about sharks all day, this was an opportunity for me to share all these other fun facts that I've learned, um, about inverts and about corals and things like that. Um, you know, on a serious note, it is obviously very bittersweet to be down here when with such a love for corals as divers we see on these coral reef dives more than many other folks get to see in person, um, how our corals are struggling here in South Florida, especially after we had this warming event recently. We, I, I know many of you have heard about this and have seen it for yourselves. Um, so this it was also an incredible um, experience to write this book, but then also uh, very humbling thinking about like trying to get kids excited about coral reefs that we're frantically trying to save as well. Um, so next slide, please. Um, on that note, um, thank you for letting me share a little bit about that as well. And I knew that as a as divers, you would also appreciate um, being able to share some of those great animals that you find on the reef, um, including my favorite, which is the unsung hero, the little goat fish, you know, and you can like, swim around with their little barbels here. This was my chance to include some of those species that I love. Um, and then the next slide is, that's where I'm going to end for now. Um, I wanna make sure we have time for questions. And if there are no questions, I have a million other things that I could talk about. I could go all night long talking about sharks and the research that we do. Um, but for, for now, I wanna thank you all for listening um, to the research that I've been up to. And I greatly look forward to hearing your questions. All right, fantastic. All right, so type uh, your questions in the comment. Um, we'll answer them for you. I know that along the way. So question in here. I've really been injured by catch. Yes, so great hammerheads, part of what makes them particularly good predators is that they have this big um, like boost of energy that they use to hunt, right? And they really um, amp up 
their bodies. And that also means that it's about um, a long fight. Right. Yeah, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Uh, um, I can hear myself back on the sound. I, I hope no one can hear that either. <laughs> Uh, you sound fine, Erin. I don't know. Is it, can anybody else? We're not sure if there's a feedback happening. Okay. Uh, oh, they, they can hear. Okay. Anybody else? We're not sure. Oh, I do have. Okay. So you guys uh, have to realize. So. so. <laughs> I don't know. Sound again, so. Hmm. So maybe if you wouldn't mind muting Nicole, and maybe that'll help us. Okay. Um, it wouldn't be a Facebook Live if there weren't some little technical difficulties. But um, okay, so back to the question. Yes, this was from Randy. Yes, they uh, hammerheads do have an elevated stress response, and that partially is what makes them a really good predator, but then also means that they are more sensitive than some other species if you think about, for example, a, a big fight. Um, so yes. Um, <laughs> Nicole sounds like the Terminator. That's a compliment. That's very cool. Um, so Let's see, were there any other questions? Is there anything that you've learned that's been very surprising to you? Yeah, oh my gosh, there's so many things. I'm like surprising, I'm, I'm learning new things all the time. Um, I would say that there's kind of two answers to that question. Um, one is, you know, when I came to into studying sharks, uh, my previous background, the, the largest thing I had handled in the field was like a sea urchin, or um, my research, you know, were, was seafood. So it was dead red snapper. Um, there was a bit of a learning curve when I came in to learn how to handle sharks. And I wasn't quite sure what to expect. And I think you never really know uh, how you're going to respond in the situation until you get in it. And I, you know, I moved down here and moved my life down here. And I was like, gee, I hope I can, I get in the situation and I, and I like it. And I would say that's been really surprising to me in a very positive way. Um, you know, working with these sharks it takes a lot of training. Um, it's always very humbling um, being up close with them. And then also, I'm really proud to be part of this research team where, every, you know, the, the amount of training that goes into it and the amount of care and concern for the animals is just is massive. Um, and I'm really fortunate to work under some really incredible leaders in our lab um, that the lab is co-advised by Yanni Papasamatu and Damian Chapman that have, you know, many, 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 many years of experience with this with shark handling. So um, that has been uh, an incredible part to learn. And, and I'm really happy um, that the to have built those skills. Um, as far as the the research, um, I'm one of the things that was surprising is that you know great hammerheads. When you do the calculations of how many calories they need to consume, it is less than you might think. It's less than we need to eat in a day. Um, and you think about these massive animals and how is that possible that great hammerheads have to eat less than us? Um, but partially that's because, or all of it is because, uh, they are ectotherms and we are endotherms, meaning great hammerheads are, you know, we spend so much energy keeping our bodies the same temperature all the time. You know, it, we're around 98 degrees, whether we're, um, excuse me, <clears throat> in air conditioning or in the heat, I'm so sorry, <clears throat> but great hammerheads, like many fish, almost all fish, their body temperatures will match the environment around them. Um, so they just simply don't have to put as many calories towards keeping their bodies a uh, consistent temperature. Um, if you could swim, dive with any shark in the world, what would it be? Oh, I love this question so much. Um, so I, it used to be whale sharks. And then I got to do that in Hawaii. We were doing a completely unrelated research. And then out of nowhere, we're on the dive boat. We had just come up from a dive and one of the dive masters like screams. And then we look over and there's this, this juvenile whale shark, which is still massive. Like the juveniles are still in the largest shark I've ever seen just hanging out next to the boat. And we just sat on this, on the gunnel and looked at this shark and it was the, and, and then we jumped in just with our masks and just hung out next to it and got to watch. And that was really incredible. So it was definitely that, but now that I've done that, 
Um, I would definitely do it again. But then I think I would love to see, um, um, I've never seen a Mako shark. Um, I'd really love to see one. And I would definitely get uh, in the water, close to the boat, but in the water with one. Um, oh, I love this question. So you brought up a great point. Uh, not every person has access firsthand. Do you know if there are any VR videos that people can watch to feel fully immersed with the shark dives? So I have to think about the shark dives in particular, but I know that Google Earth has some truly incredible coral reef 360 experiences. And unfortunately, off the top of my head, I cannot remember who they partnered with to do that. Um, it they partnered with an organization to get these fully immersive 360 Google Earth experiences. And if you search like Google Earth coral reefs, I'm sure you'll be able to find it. And it's something that I really I point students to actually in the book as part of the curriculum guide, which is um, you're able to go all over the world, see different sorts of coral reefs, which is very cool because you can compare them in different places. Um, you know, because it's on the computer, you don't need any additional, um, you know, VR headset or anything. And then what you can do also is they have examples of bleached versus non-bleached reefs. So you can look to the left and see a really healthy reef ecosystem. Then you can look to the right and see one that is bleached. And it's a really, really powerful visual learning opportunity. Um, and so that I would definitely recommend sharing that as well. Can you offer a uh, thought of how the average person can help reefs and sharks maintain stable condition and population? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things that I always talk that I always try to talk to people about is like helping sharks. The best way you can help sharks is by creating a healthy ocean environment. So I think some people, especially if you don't live near an area where there are sharks, think they feel very disconnected and say, how can I possibly help? Um, but things um, as simple as making sustainable, I guess it's not that simple, but making sustainable seafood choices. Um, I love the resource that the Monterey Bay Aquarium uses, um, which is the Seafood Watch uh, app and guides. So if you're familiar with Seafood Watch, they have them regionally and you can say, all right, I live in the Southeast United States, show me what fish I should be eating. And they have green, yellow, and red fish where green is obviously, that's a great choice, go ahead. Um, they use a bunch of different factors in making that decision, whether that is the uh, populations of the fish, are they at a sustainable population level, um, as well as what is the fishing method. Sometimes certain fishing methods are much more destructive to the habitat than others. Um, so they take a lot of different things into account. And then the yellow ones, oh, they also include like health. So um, are these fish particularly high in mercury or other things like that? Um, and then of course, the ones on the red list, they, they really try to tell you to avoid. And of course, that is changing all of the time. Um, so I just it's a very easy app on my phone that sometimes I, I like to reference. Um, I want to be clear, you know, I love seafood, I eat it all the time. Sometimes you cannot confirm where the fish came from, and you just do your best, right? You just try to do your best as a consumer. Um, the other thing, of course, is uh, making sure that policymakers know that ocean health and coral reef health is important to you. That means, um, you know, calling your local offices, calling your senators and your representatives, you know, when there are issues like our bleaching in the coral reefs in Florida, like that is an issue that's important to us. And even if you don't live here, it should be important to everyone because, you know, coral reefs make up 1% of the sea floor, but are home to about 25% of all the marine life. So it should be an issue that we're all passionate about. Um, and I think there's lots of things we can do as individuals, which is great, but some of the big major changes are going to come from telling our, uh, the people that are making the policy decisions that ocean health is important to us. Um, is there any way to help with the research? Oh, sure. Um, if you, cause you don't live in Florida, is there any way to help with the research online? Um, so for this particular research, um, we are there, we don't have any opportunities currently because I'm hoping to graduate next year. So I'm in the writing phase, trying to wrap up my PhD. So this particular project, um, there isn't a way to join, um, but I'm going to see if I can pull some resources and actually send a force E because there are often opportunities, for example, I talked about the uh, underwater video systems. You know, there's projects that are putting these bruvs all over the world to collect video data. Um, and then someone's got to go through all that video data. So they are uh, in, you know, enlisting the help of citizen scientists 
to help review a lot of that data with fish ID. And especially if you've got some background in fish ID as divers or know how to navigate those great fish ID books, um, that helps even better. So I'm going to um, send some resources to Nicole that you can share with the 4C community if you're interested in some citizen science um, online as well. Uh, the thresher, thresher sharks, that's amazing. Um, that's great. Oh, thank you for sharing the video. I appreciate it. Um, are you aware? Uh, so this is talking about the levels of shark populations, right? Um, and, you know, we are in a really interesting and unique situation compared to many parts of the country that we are up close with these sharks as well, right? Um, you know, many, many shark populations uh, were absolutely overfished and greatly declined. Um, and some of things to some of them were on the brink of extinction, including, for example, the great hammerhead is still critically endangered. There's many other species that are endangered. Um, when regulations are put into place, those numbers were many species numbers were starting to rebound. And so uh, some folks are saying, oh, I'm seeing more sharks than I used to. And partially that's because some of our conservation methods are working in some of these populations that were really depressed because of uh, overfishing. Um, you know, with uh, the ocean is the shark's home. And when we go into uh, the ocean, we are going into the shark's home, which I think many, many people are conscientious of. Um, but it's not uh, an issue of overpopulation. It's about these rebounding populations that were uh, greatly declining. Um, you know, we, one of the things I'm sure some of the folks on this call have seen, the divers, um, if you do any of the wrecks um, in West Palm, um, there's a lot of different species that we see there. Um, we not only see the great hammerheads, we also see lots of bull sharks, uh, lots of different types of reef sharks, lemon sharks, um, sandbars, um, tiger sharks, so, and a lot of nurse sharks as well, depending on where you are. Um, sometimes you get a lot of nurse sharks. Uh, one thing that I meant to mention uh, earlier when I was talking about the different research projects, so, you know, I specifically target great hammerhead sharks, right? And when we get a great hammerhead shark, I do my data collection and send it on its way. Um, but sometimes you're not going to get a great hammerhead shark. You know, we put, we use bonita as our bait, a lot of different species like bonita. Um, so for example, if we got a bull shark, there are other projects that are going on in the lab where researchers are trying to focus on bull sharks. So if I'm out there looking for hammerheads, but I get a bull shark, I can take samples for those other researchers that will help further those projects as well. Um, and that's not just within FIU. There's lots of cross collaboration throughout universities, not just in South Florida, but throughout the state and throughout the country where, um, you know, some folks are like, oh, I'm really interested in this type of sample, a little fin clip. Can I have that? And then we um, share that as well. So the idea is that we're never in working up a shark without it fulfilling this sort of scientific question or mission that data needs to be used. And part of that, the ethics of that as well, is that if you're going to take data from these animals, um, it is our responsibility to share that data, publish it, um, make sure we can use that data in a way that supports either the protection of those species or the protection of their habitat or learning more about them so we can better design those protections. Um, so I think, you know, it's really a blessing to be able to work on them, but it's also a responsibility that if we are going to be asking something of these animals by taking data, that we are contributing to answering questions that will help them as well. Um, I think I got all the questions. Oh, and we're right at 720. Wow, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> I think you're on mute. <laughs> um, thing too, guys, is I am to your Facebook page, and I'm going to show you guys go to Aaron's Facebook page. I have the go and look at this versus hammerhead and watch more about this um yeah um thank you for sharing that so this uh bull shark versus hammerhead uh was a show that we did this year with researchers um at florida international university as well as moat marine lab um and some other partners as well uh that looked at the biology and ecology of hammerheads and bull sharks and we're essentially trying to 
answer, you know, which one would be the top predator amongst these two top predators. Um, so there's a lot of really exciting research in there. I'm really ex you'll get to see if you watch it some of the tags that I showed you in this presentation. Um, frankly, when it comes to this research, one trick pony. I just put these final loggers out there. That's just one small portion of all of the research that's represented within this show. So I would definitely encourage you to watch it. Um, obviously, I'm a little biased, but I, we had a great time doing it, and it was very cool to show off this video as well. Awesome. I oh, get to show you guys this website. And if you, you'll see this big, cool, you'll see this uh, photo here. Sharks, and it goes to our Shark Month page. This is about um, the Florida Shark Ecology course. You can dive and then it has on here um have uh if you didn't hear the first we have a shark tooth dive over in venice 15 and uh, um a three tank specialized megaliton or sometimes guys but um, you can look for sharks and the shark trip to, um, that one, if you click on here, page where you can sign up and get more, is going to be December 17th, and, uh, then you go and do your hammerhead dice, so, if you're interested in these, find all that information. Like I said, just go to the event either here or support sharks as well. It's down below. Up on October 7th, we actually have another Facebook. Let's hire the gals over at the and they're going to be talking about what they do left so make sure you tune in so come to the sos birthday bash uh lauder ale brewery it's been a big fan and support for great and have some fun um uh, having a, uh, if you went to our red, we got your name and we this, and we're gonna raffle off butter shark hat. So there's a has a shark on it. It's from Born of Water. We're gonna store and uh, pick a button. Let's see who the winner is. Michael! Oh, oh Michael. gosh, what is that? Oh, good. I don't want to watch ads. No. Of course. Oh, oh, I don't want this. Okay. So, Michael, you are our winner. You can go into the Four C store, all email and redeem and get that hat in and also think a great presentation um shark science and other types we have you back for some of these other types Everyone really liked your your presentation more <laughs> thank you so much yeah. All right, guys. And come in to foresee this. We'll see ya. Bye.